It's all good. Um, okay, cool. So we're going to talk about uh, diversity, right? Fundamental to our assessment of ecosystems, fundamental to our understanding if something is stress, if something is well-functioning, um, et cetera, in a basic way that we characterize what a um, community is like. So, but one example for why we might want to understand diversity and, and how it can be useful, we could talk about um, uh, trying to solve a problem. So here is the challenge. The challenge is we have this um, invasive species that has been unintentionally introduced um, from elsewhere. In this case, it's from China. Um, and it's a problematic species, and we're, we're worried about where it's going to be, and it's starting to show up. So, so you're the conservation biologist, and someone says, oh my gosh, how are we going to deal with this um, invader? How are we going to control it? How are we going to know where it's going to be? And, and you're like, I don't know. This is the whole, the whole state, the whole region. I, I don't know where to look. Well, we could start to use um, um, some aspects of sort of first principles of the organism's natural history to try to start to make some first guesses. And so in this case, we have, this is what this little beetle looks like, this little invasive beetle. Very pretty, unfortunately, causes problems. Um, and so what we can do is we can say, okay, uh, it's, new, it's new here. We don't know what it's going to do, if it's going to be like take over the world or just die out or, or whatever. But, but let's start with seeing what it does back home, what it does in its, its uh, original territory. And so we can go, okay, we're going to go out there. We're going we're to find where this critter exists in its native China and start to measure some things about uh, where it exists. All right? So we're going to maybe measure... Uh, uh, where we found it, and then some of the abiotic conditions. Oh, okay, this, this critter is um, where it's hot, but not where it's cold, or near where it's dry, but not where it's wet, or, or whatever the aspect is, right? And we come up with some relationship between these, these basic um, parameters. And then we can come in and we can uh, uh, take that, those um, areas of the individual occurrences and then say, okay, well, they're in this whole region, so let's look at the general characteristics of this region. And then, and so in this case, this is where it's from in, in, um, in China. And so the golden dots are specific collection locations or study locations where we know this critter existed. And then it seems like those conditions are basically mostly in the blue, in the, in the light blue, and maybe sort of sometimes in the dark blue, right? So we get some, some rough estimate. And then we can just take that and apply that in our new area. So let's now apply it to, say, this new inv invasion or potential invasion in the US. So if, if we're assuming these are where the, the critter can live back there, this is where it can live over here. And so that's great. So we be you know, now we can begin to say, aha, so this is maybe where um, they're most likely to get a toehold, a foothold. Um, the next thing we would do is say, OK, great. So this, this is very helpful, right? This is first principles. And then the next thing we do is say, hey, so what, how is this going to um, impact other things, things beyond it? So this is where it, maybe it, it could live, but maybe what might it do? To do that next step, what might it do? We need to sort of understand what the community is like, right? What, what the other organisms in its local area um, are like, what they do, et cetera. And so for that, we need to start to look at diversity. And so that's what we're going to do today. We're going to start um, uh, figuring out how we can make some measures and basic characterization of how complex a system is, for example. And that would be the next step. So this would be the first step, and then we'd start to look at the community. And so to do that, we need to understand diversity. Before we start talking about diversity, um, I first want to outline some general diversity um, uh, metrics, which is mostly what we'll talk about, mostly what, what you would do as a conservation biologist or if you're going to work as a consultant, the kind of things you would calculate. And then some more community-specific metrics that aren't used as, as widely. So the take-home today is we're going to, we want to talk about these three primary fundamental um, characteristics of diversity. We have richness, we have evenness, and we have heterogeneity. Um, and so we'll talk about each of those uh, in turn. As we start to talk about quantifying diversity, um, 
it's important to say that um, we default to talking about, in most cases, species diversity, right? That's species is our fundamental unit, species is our fundamental uh, 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 ecological organizing principle we typically work with. Um, but there are other units. We could talk about uh, gen genera, family, um, all kinds of other taxonomic levels. We could also talk about other forms of diversity. The examples we're going to talk about right now just apply to categories. We're going to default to, say, species richness, but you could do family richness. You could do um, uh, morphology richness, how many big things versus medium things versus small things, right? So, so these principles are independent of species, even though we often have the word species richness or species evenness attached to them. So just realize that they're more powerful than that. And I'll just um, also note this, right? So this is a green jay in Mexico. This is diversity as well, right? Um, the behaviors, the interactions, the, the, the goings on of life is also part of diversity. Those typically aren't measured, but we totally could. We could measure the song diversity of the forest and use these same techniques. So, so while we default to species diversity, don't get tricked in thinking that species diversity equals diversity. That's but one form of diversity in our biological world. Okay. To figure out diversity, to figure out if this beetle is um, you know, going to be invading and causing problems and how many other beetles around or how many this or that, we, we need to first measure our community. And just like these measures are independent of the, the taxonomic unit or the organizing unit, right? They're also independent of the exact way we collect that uh, estimate. So typically, um, like for example, in our, in our bean lab, we will work on numerical uh, counts, right? So how many, how many birds are here? How many, how many horses are here? That type of stuff. So just straight up numbers. How many in a certain, in a, def, in a defined area? But you can also calculate diversity with a whole host of other things. And there's just a, a handful of, you can think of many more. Um, but biomass is another one. So particularly when we talk about, this is a big one for our colleagues that study fire. So when they go in, they're like, hey, what's the, what, what's the vegetative landscape like? A lot of times what people do is go in, physically harvest, they'll drop their quadrat down, physically harvest all the above ground biomass, all the shrubs, all the, all the tissues from there, take it back to the lab, dry it, and then weigh it, and then use that dry weight as their measure of, of biomass, which also helps us understand the potential fuel in the, in the context of wildfire. So we could, it could be numbers, it could be biomass, it could be cover, plant folks, and um, people that work in the intertidal that do um, sessile invertebrate stuff often use percent cover as their measure. Um, we have to do something a little bit different with, uh, with cover. We have to do a little bit of adjustment because that's a proportion and not a, not a, a value that can range up to infinity, but still. It's, it's a totally fine thing to use for calculations. And then we can do something like productivity, which would be something like the amount of biomass uh, accrued over a period of time. Um, and this would be big for people working on things like carbon sequestration or um, productivity of the oceans, uh, health of the oceans, things, things of that nature. Cool. Questions so far? The next sort of broad, jet, you know, overarching idea is when we do go out and sample to, to measure that diversity, we do need to, to give some thought as to what we're measuring. Generally speaking, we're going to do diversity on one segment. In our bean lab, we'll do beans. In the context of the beetle invasion, maybe we do the insect community. Um, uh, and so we'd, we, we'd pick something. We don't actually typically go and do everything under the sun. Um, uh, so rarely do we measure across different trophic levels. Rarely do we measure when we're, when we're looking at the the diversity of the of the kelp reef. Rarely do we do sharks and gobies, for example, in the same in the same uh, survey. 
and and usually uh, yeah so that yeah so the second one is, is basically another restatement of, of the, the second sub bullet point is is another statement of the first which is just that um, you know we rarely do the the whole thing we're doing a subset we're doing the trees we're doing the grazers we're doing the animals that kind of stuff um, and uh, it's important to cast as wide a net as possible um, spatially, or at least in terms of trying to capture as much of the community as you can logistically. We always have pushback logistic stuff, right? The ideal thing would be to walk in the forest and count every single tree, right? That would be great. But rarely do we have the time, the person power, the, the money, whatever to do that. So, so we're constrained. But the idea is the more we sample, the larger the sample size, the more accurately we're going to characterize that community, and the more um, likely our diversity measures are to be really useful and reflective of the actual system. OK. The first one, the first uh, uh, granddaddy, would be richness. So again, going on forward here, we're going to talk about species, but you, it could be—it's just categories, right? You, you can you can apply it to whatever level you want. But but okay. So for richness, this is the number of species in a given area. It is by far the oldest measure of diversity. It's the easiest one to measure. The term richness was coined in '67, but people have been talking about richness long before 1967. And it's, it's pretty much easy. Everybody can do this. You guys can do this. First graders can do this. Non-technical experts can do this. It's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, so let's take uh, a first stab at some of this. Um, the first thing we can do when we're starting to, to count things, um, let's say we go out in the forest or the grassland, and we say, OK. Uh, you know, how many things are here? One thing we could do if we had the time, um, and this is what maybe folks that are working at a museum or something of that nature might do, go and, and, and uh, slice off a chunk of that grassland, a, a square meter or whatever, and, and pull it in the lab and pick out every single last little individual, right? And so we're, we're looking at all the different insects, looking at all the different plants, all that kind of good stuff. When we do that, what we tend to find is there's very few, there's very few um, uh, species, um, or sorry, yeah. There's, there's very few species that have um, a lot of stuff, right? So, so, so well, let me say it a different way. Not every critter is equally abundant in the community, right? And we have some critters that are um, all over the place, and, and we, we get them a lot. And then we have a lot of other critters that are represented by very few individuals, right? So in other words, the, uh, we have some that are, that are a lot, and then, and then we're going to decay away. And this is called a rank abundance plot. Another way we can look at this is we could say, hey, we went up there and we, and we, we, we sampled, and I, I grabbed, you know, I got my chunk of the grassland, and I grabbed my first grab, and I checked it out, and I measured it. And then I grabbed my second grab, and I checked it out. I grabbed my third grab, et cetera. So we call this a species accumulation curve. Um, and these are also helpful in sort of the, the first, first pass, and, and they can help us compare communities. So let's, let me tell you how we, we get these things, how we use these things. So this is some real data from um, diatoms in the bottom of a creek in Pennsylvania. And uh, so this researcher went out and basically threw down a bunch of box, threw down a bunch of sampling grabs uh, in on the bottom of the creek. And he picked up the stuff that was in the box, brought it back to the lab, uh, sorted through everything, and counted all the different diatoms. Right? What species they were, how many, how many they encountered, et cetera. And so this is a subset of a much larger data set, right? So we had box one, box two, box three, box all this kind of stuff. And there's many more box, there's many more species in this. But for example, this particular species, um, he uh, found 306 of them in this one sample. And the next sample, the other sample, he found 206 of them. And then, you know, on and on. And so, 
So some things are about the same uh, uh, encounter rate. Others are, are quite different. So this one, I, he got five of this species. He got five in box eight, but, but 37 in the other box. Or this dude, he got five in this one and none in box seven, right? So the natural world is variable, right? So we, we want to um, get as many logistical grabs as we can, and that will help us. So we do this, do this a bunch of times, and this is what we get. So this is, um, this is uh, after lots and lots of samples. So in this particular study, uh, there was a total of 4,874 different diatoms that were encountered and counted. And they all fell into one of 112 different species categories. Um, and so what I'm showing you here is the, is the rarefaction curve for uh, uh, box eight. Okay? And so what we see here is as we start talking uh, how, many, how, many, um, how many samples we, we grab, right, initially every each next little grab, we get a lot more added to our knowledge. Oh, there's, there's a lot more. And then as we go through time, it starts to slow down. Everybody with me? And, and now we've, we, we're, we've started, we've kind of saw a lot of it already, right? We got it, we got it, we got it. And the number of new categories of things, new species of things starts to slow down. And eventually it, it, it approaches an asymptote, right? It approaches being flat where we might get more individuals, but we're not getting any new species, any new categories. And so what this tells us, so for example, what did I write down here? So what this tells us is, um, yeah, so if we take 2,000, if we, if we sampled 2,000, uh, count of the first 2,000 individuals we saw in this creek, that's gonna uh, be about 94 species, right? So that's a, that sort of helps us get a rough idea as to what's going on with the system, how diverse it is, how many species are packed in there. And it also tells us that the larger we sample, or, or, or the, the more we sample, the more categories we'll capture, right? So, so as I said before, we want to measure as much as we practically can that, that makes sense. And it's always a trade-off. Now, a lot of times what, what, what people will do is once you have this data, right, we got this part, right, and we see the curve is, you know, flattening out, right, and you, the natural thing is, hey, let's, 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 let's extend it, let's extrapolate it, let's keep going off to the right to see where we hit that asymptote, right, because theoretically that asymptote is going to be the total number of species, a uh, total number of diatom species in that creek or, or kinds of trees in that forest. And so the general approach is you just, you know, as I said, mentioned, you extrapolate this out to where this is. Um, it never theoretically gets to exactly flat, but where it gets to very, 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 very close to being a flat, uh, a flat line. Um, and so that's great. The problem with extrapolation, though, is it's very sensitive to how much sampling you've done, right? So imagine, okay, so this is what the extrapolation looks like if we had, you know, yellow number of samples. But what would happen if we, if we only sampled to here, right? And we tried to extrapolate that, we're probably going to extrapolate something more like that. So, so rarefaction curves are historically a popular thing to do, but they are, they come with challenges, right? And the farther away we extrapolate from our sample, in other words, the, the smaller our sample relative to what the ultimate community's diversity is, um, the, more the, the more problem waters we can get. And we can overestimate or underestimate the actual diversity. So it turns out these types of approaches are really useful for, um, you know, so they're helping us tell, tell us about the overall richness of the community. But they're most helpful when we either do a really, really good job um, uh, measuring the uh, total community, or when we have a standard number of individuals that we count across a, a several different sites. In other words, in other words, we, we count 2,000 individuals, and we get and we get this or what is this curve? It's, I don't know, almost 5,000. We count 5,000 individuals. If then we went to another creek and counted 5,000 individuals there, and then another creek and counted 5,000 individuals there, th these rarefaction curves can be useful in comparing those systems. 
Um, but just straight up extrapolation gets us into problems. Okay. So, uh, feature versus general diversity. So can you guys um, think of any possible downsides with using richness as our measure of, of how diverse our community is? I mean, obviously it's useful, but, but are there any downsides? Um, okay, so, so maybe one of the problems might be people might ascribe other, other functioning to high richness. Okay, possibly. Okay, so, so you're saying that it's not capturing the full, the full gamut of what diversity is. So it's a little simple, that's what you're saying. Ah, okay, good. Okay, good. So, but I, but I'm asking. Um, that's true. That's true. Definitely true. But I'm asking, like, fundamentally about this measure. Do can you guys see any issues with this measure? Like the number of species that are necessary, like the number of species. Yeah. Yeah. So the same, Caleb. So you guys are sort of saying a similar thing. Like, like more things doesn't necessarily make it better. Good. Any other ideas? Okay. So here's. Here's, um, so here, here's maybe an example of what you guys are talking about. So this is some of my, some of my old grassland plots up in the San Francisco Bay Area. So this is native dominated grassland primarily, serpentine grassland. And so um, here's, here's one quadrat, everybody with me? Here's another quadrat. These two plots have the same exact species richness. Do they look identical to you? No. So what, what appears to be different? Be real careful with the, with the healthier stuff. But, 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 but it looks more, f so different flowers, is that what you're maybe trying to say, Caleb? Different flowers are more like full, I guess. OK. So there definitely seems to be more area covered by flower petals, for example. Sure. What else? a key thing here. So rich, yeah, please. Yeah, yeah, so this is the, sa the same height off the ground, yeah. Um, so the guess, are the flowers different size? Eh, kind of, maybe, um, possibly. Um, it might just be this place is a little teeny bit drier, so these guys are just starting to dry up a little bit more. Yeah, maybe maybe not count for the soil, but a, a more fundamental one here is just because we have the same number, you know, the same categories in both these, it's not the same, it's not the same community, right? In the sense of like, let's look at the let's look at the broad daisy-like flowers, the white flowers. In this one, do we have these broad daisy-like flowers? Yes, we do. How many do we have? Oh, here we have a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, you know, I don't know, seven or eight, something like that. In this one, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 20, 20, 20 you know, something like that, right? So yes, we have that category represented, but it's a different relative amount of things within those categories. So richness ignores all that. Richness just says, do you have at least one flower of species A and at least one flower of species B and at least one flower of species C? It doesn't, it doesn't ask you if you have 300 representatives of flower species A or one. That's equal. That's equal in measures of richness. As long as you have one, check box, good, go on to the next. And so the next level of sophistication with, um, and let me, let me just pause right here for a second. These are all important measures of diversity. They all have value. So it's not like we're, we're, we're getting to the best one. Sometimes people make that error. These all have utility. These are all important. These all tell us about the system. But, but um, 
to deal with some of the limitations or, or, or some of the obvious, some, just glancing at this, like, yeah, these look different, right? But the number might come out the same in terms of richness. So maybe we need, a, in this kind of comparison, maybe we need a different representation to compare grass plot A to grass plot B. Okay, so let's look at this. So here, we, let's say we have two hypothetical communities. Which one is more diverse? Community one or community two, do you guys think? Two. Why, and why, whoever said two, why did you guys say two? Okay, good. Good. So, so community one is basically all about the species A. And, and you can imagine if we, if, if we put all the individuals in a box and we closed our eyes and stuck our hand in the box and pulled out a random individual, in community one, it's going to be A. We're going to pull out an A on average. Then I put my hand back in the box and I pull out again and I pull out another A. I put my hand back in the box, pull, I just keep pulling A's out all the time, right? Probably, you know, on average. Whereas community two, I put my hand in, maybe I pull out A for the first one. The next one, I'm just as likely to pull out a C or a D or whatever, right? So, so this is, um, so therefore we would say that community two is more diverse. And so the term we use for that is evenness. And so note the richness here for both these is the same. There's four categories, four species in each. So if we just use richness, richness would say these communities are equally diverse. But in terms of an evenness measure, uh, community two is more diverse. So evenness is a relational measure. So, so it's not just presence or absence, but it is uh, the relative amount of individuals in category one versus the relative amount of individuals in category two versus the relative amount of individuals in category three and so forth. Even as tech, and so even as is spelled with two N's, that's also something people sometimes um, uh, confuse. Um, but it, so even as is essentially the equality of species in a community. Uh, the term evenness was first coined in 64. Note this is coined, uh, you know, this term is, is older than richness, even though these ideas have been floating around for some time. But the formal, formal use, use of the term evenness. And basically it says the more equitably distributed the species in an area, the higher the evenness. And generally speaking, that's going to be a, 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 a relative measure with one being perfectly even. And, and zero, meaning nothing's there, so you never theoretically get to zero, assuming you have at least two, individual, two, individual, two species in your sampling. And you almost never in the natural world get to one. So it's, gonna it's, a, it's a proportional measure, zero to one, one being more even. Okay, the third big honcho, the third major honcho you need to know about, so we have richness, we have evenness, and then we have heterogeneity. So heterogeneity is going to combine both richness and evenness together. And the term heterogeneity was first coined in 49. Um, and there's a really useful review, if you guys are so motivated, in 1974, that still is very helpful in terms of thinking about these things. Um, people have proposed other measures since 1974, but, but this, this is a useful um, a useful paper. In general, the more heterogeneous the site is, we tend to see higher measures of species uh, diversity, species heterogeneity. So let's look again at our example. So here's our community one, community two. Again, community one, we have four species. Community two, we have four species. And um, so richness is the same, evenness differs. When we calculate heterogeneity, it turns out that community two is, and, and there's different measures of heterogeneity, but this is Shannon Wiener. Uh, 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 this is um, more diverse. So, cool. Things get complicated, though, when we have one community that has four species and the next community has seven, right? Or seven and 11. In the real world, it starts to get much more complicated uh, pretty quickly. 
So in terms of measuring diversity, um, fundamentally we need to have a measure, uh, to do measures of, of um, most of these more sophisticated heter heterogeneity measures, we need to have both richness and evenness. Um, and we can um, express that in a couple different ways. So species richness is um, a, a very straightforward thing that people do. Species distribution, uh, abundance of uh, species distribution, we could do that as well. And then um, these different, uh, more sophisticated measures. So evenness, there's two main, there's, there's more than this, but there's two main things that you guys probably should use in your careers if you go out and work for a consulting firm or go work for a government agency or something like that. Um, the, the, the most robust ones are Smith and Wilson and Camargo's you know, uh, index of evenness. Um, and so I used to have you guys hand calculate all these, but uh, I don't know. It doesn't, I don't know if that really matters so much these days. Um, basically, um, these guys are good and robust in real world situations. So we can create a whole bunch of different mathematical expressions of evenness. But these two seem to work best um, with, with Eve, with, and so if you see this, this is uh, Smith and Wilson. This is also called E sub var, E, you pronounce that E and then sub and it's V-A-R, so E var. And then this is E prime, these two, these two different measures. But um, E var is the one out, for most of us, that's probably the one that would be best to go with. So E var uh, does have a good fit on both rare and common critters. So some of these indices are particularly sensitive to having rare individuals or having common individuals and sometimes can skew stuff. So, so E var is the one I would suggest. In terms of heterogeneity, um, uh, without going in, again, I used to spend time going into all this, but I don't know how helpful it is. Suffice it to say there's two broad approaches to measuring heterogeneity. Um, one is based about based on sampling theory in space. How many more individuals we're likely to encounter if we sample a little bit more and, and go another couple meters into the forest. The other is based on information theory, which was first created um, when we we were in the early days of the telephone um, uh, revolution and trying to figure out how how um, how we can maximize signal um, to. Uh, throw as much, as, as little data down the data lines as possible. Um, and so, anyway, uh, there, there are very different um, ways of going at and getting them. Um, but basically, the two we're left with is Shannon Wiener. It's Shannon Wiener. Note that there was an error in a textbook about 35, 40 years ago. And the person writing it typed in Shannon and Weaver, like a weaver, like someone weaving something, that's wrong. It's Shannon Wiener. And when we have something, so we have something like the Smith and Wilson, these two folks created the idea, created the hypothesis, created the tool, and so we, we, that's their names, right? In this case, when it's something like this, this was, um, these two folks basically at the same time independently, essentially independently came up with it. So they, they both crafted it. Um, sometimes you'll see this expressed as the Shannon diversity index, um, but it's really the Shannon Wiener. Um, and so, and, and the symbol for that is H prime. Um, and then the other big one I would just direct your attention to is the reciprocal of Simpson's D, which is D is capital D, and it's just a minus one as the as the um, superscript. Uh, the, they both have value. Most people, if they pick a, diver, a heterogeneity measure, this, this Shannon Wiener is the thing that wins. Note, though, that this is going to give extra, extra importance to rare things. So those things that there's only one individual in the category or two or three of those individuals in the category, they will have a disproportionate impact on the, on the resulting index. And Simpson's D is the inverse of that. So Simpson's D tends to be... Um, uh, strongly influenced by things that are common. 
And there's no right or wrong here. It's just, hey, if I'm worried about this endangered species and I want to be really make sure this endangered species is playing a role, I'm probably going to use something more like the H prime, right? Whereas if I'm, if I'm talking about like sort of long-term health of this thing and I'm worried about these core, core fundamental um, T-stone species in the community, maybe I might want to use more like D. Um, in most cases, in most cases for the kind of stuff we're doing, we don't know um, how we're going to use those. And so, you know, either one is fine. Either one is fine. So we have measure, we have richness. We have met a couple different options for evenness. We have a couple different options for heterogeneity. Uh, by default, I would do EVAR and H prime as my, as my things if I just had to pick one. Cool? Make sense? Okay. Some other general assumptions that we need to uh, make sure we're, we're, we're writing down and keeping in our head is that with all these things, these, this, 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 this is a simplification of nature, right? As, as is any model or any metric. Um, and so first, uh, we're assuming that all species are equal in this, right? So we're assuming that the bat and the grizzly bear, if we're doing a, a measure of mammals in our, in our national park or whatever, these both count the same, right? Obviously, ecologically, they behave very differently, right? Um, but uh, a category is a category. The next assumption with these things, so all, 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 you know, category one is no different than category two. The next is that any individual we encounter of category one is the same as every other individual in category one. So this. So this giant squid on the left is the same as one little individual that's going to hatch out of this egg case, right? So th this is a squid egg case, and there's, there's you know, hundreds of, of babies in this one sausage um, egg case, and then there's a dozens and dozens of egg cases, right? So, so an individual is an individual is an individual. It doesn't matter if this old, massive female that can produce lots of eggs, or it's some just born little, little youngin or whatever, right? So, so an, an individual of that species is an individual of that species. And then thirdly, that, uh, and, and this, uh, this is really, really important. And this is a, a lot of people commit this error. Oh, yeah, so let me explain. So, um, well, I'll, I'll just say it first. So, so the sampling method and scale should be appropriate and compatible. That sounds like, that sounds kind of stupid, like, a, okay, it sounds like a tautology or something, but, but it should be. So for example, um, today we're going to use quadrats in our bean lab, but, but um, whatever, right? We're using quadrats. Um, that quadrat should be the right size, and there should be enough of them to properly measure that community. But then the real important thing, that, and this is where people are getting into, a, are potentially getting into a lot of issues, is um, many of you are not raised with a deep natural history understanding, right? So, so um, you know, when I was an undergrad, you know, I had to take a class on birds and I had to learn about, and then I learned about algae and uh, you know, lizards and all that kind of stuff, right? How many species identification classes have you guys had? So far, okay. So this is the this is the norm, and th and so this is this is not the norm. I mean, we in ESRM we try very hard to, by the time you guys graduate, make sure you know how to identify things and stuff. But even we don't do a great job. Bio, depending on your electives, you could avoid all that entirely, right? Depending on depending on what your major is and what your what the offerings are, right? Um. And this is going on across all these universities across the, the US and to an extent across the globe, right? What's happening is that we're replacing natural history understanding with all this emphasis on biomedical stuff. So let me tell you how to run a jail. Let me show you how to do molecular biology. All cool things, all cool things to be sure, but we can only teach you so many things, right? And so as a consequence, we have to sacrifice stuff. And what has been sacrificed is understanding and being able to enumerate the birds, the trees, the bacteria, that kind of stuff, right? 
And so, while, so what that means is we have fewer and fewer experts that are great identifiers of birds, of trees, of grass. And so more so than in the past, when you are called to do a task or someone in your agency or your company is called upon to do this task, you're going to go Google it. You're going to go search the database and find a study, right? Which is totally cool. That's legit. But for, for these diversity calculations to work, the scales have to be comparable. So someone could have calculated the Shannon Wiener index of a desert shrub community in 1960, right? And now we want to know, oh my god, we're putting in a solar power plant. We want to know if, if this community is endangered and they put in a solar power plant. We're going to go back and look at what the community is like now and see if it's impacted, let's say. We need to sample the shrubs or calculate the, uh, you know, collect the underlying data to inform the diversity index with the same methodologies and tools. Otherwise, we can very easily be misled. So this number three, which sounds very obvious that, hey, we should, when we're calculating diversity indices and comparing things, it should be the same spatial scale, the same effort, whatever. But increasingly, things are getting wildly off track, where people are just, they're desperate for any data. And they're like, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And because many folks don't have a good natural history grounding, it's easy to just grab a number out of a table and compare it to another number from another table. And you need, and sometimes, sometimes you have to, so you don't have a whole lot of choice, but you should make sure that you're, you understand that you're violating the assumptions of these comparisons, right? Make sense? Questions? Okay. The last little bit is, and so that, that's most of the stuff that you guys would be called upon to do or understand. So richness, evenness, heterogeneity. Um, there are some other things that, that are, are less commonly um, used, certainly less commonly used in, in the management literature and stuff of that nature. But, but just for com completeness, I should go through this. So this would be um, community-specific diversity measures. And so this is, these now are all relative to some real-world extent in space. So the first here... So we're going to have three, we're also going to have three things here, alpha, beta, and gamma. So we're going to start with alpha diversity. Alpha diversity is just stuff we've already talked about. So alpha diversity is the, is the diversity in a particular place. You know, this, this, this grassland, right? The, 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 and, and I should say this diversity measure could be whatever. It could be richness or an evenness or heterogeneity. You could plug whichever you want in there, whatever you want in there. But alpha diversity is, is, is what we're talking about right here. And so all those previous measures, if we go out to, if we go out to the lawn right now and count weeds in the lawn with richness or, or what have you, that would be a measure of alpha diversity. Okay. Next is beta diversity. And so we can think of this as a rate of replacement, a turnover, a change uh, as we go between community types. And so you can think of this as a measure of the landscape heterogeneity. So as we go from the grassland to the top of the mountain, right, or the grassland at the bottom of the hill to the grassland at the top of the mountain, right, how, how, how does the community turn over? That's beta diversity. And so we can look at alpha and beta here. So we have two different communities. Here and these and, and so the the lo colored lines are a different species, or each each color is a different species. And um, and it's just a relative abundance, right? So as, as we go up on the on the y-axis, there's more more individuals. Everybody with me? And so we're we're going across an environmental gradient. It, let's call it meters. Maybe it's it's 200 meters. It could be around a rainfall. It doesn't matter, right? But we're going across some gradient. Okay. So alpha diversity would be this part over here. So we start over here on our initial patch, right? And we, we, we could maybe calculate richness here, right? Which in, I guess on the, on the left, on the, excuse me, the lower, that would be like, let's say for this place, it would be like three species, right? And then we could calculate the evenness based on the relative abundance, et cetera. This guy would have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten species, right? And we can also calculate the evenness and stuff based on there, right? But note, as we go across 
the, the, um, the gradient, we get different compositions of things. So some things are, are more or like this species is more or less the same. Yeah, it goes up and down, but it doesn't change that much. Other things go from zero to a super abundant and then back down to zero. So some things are kind of just changing because things are up and down, and others are like, oh my God, it's a total different, like they don't exist here, right? So, they, so we'd say, in this case, in the, in the, in the um, upper case, we'd say that the, the green and the pink species, yeah, they kind of change a bit, right? Kind of change a bit. Um, maybe pink doesn't do well in one end, but then it does really well in the other range. Whereas in the bottom, there's wholesale turnover, right? Wholesale replacement, where green is only in this one part and no pink, and pink is only in this part where there's no green, et cetera. Make sense? So, that, so that's uh, alpha and beta diversity. Yeah, so there's high alpha on the top and low beta, and here there's low alpha and high beta. Make sense? Questions? Okay. And the last one is gamma diversity. So gamma is, is this grassland here and then this grassland um, in, a, in a different, you know, in another geographic location. So this, this valley floor grassland here, and then we drive 100 miles to, I don't know, Bakersfield or whatever the heck, and look at that valley floor grassland there. So it's the same idea as before. It's turnover, it's replacement, but now we're going from this, the, you know, the same community to a, another community in space, you know, geographically distinct in space. And it's the same idea. And so, for example, here, we could talk about um, this specie, uh, species in the Santa Monica Mountains or in the mountains around San Francisco. And uh, so the first bird species is in both. But species B is only in the Santa Monica's. Species C is in both. And then D and E are only in San Francisco, right? So, um, so we can see that the, the total turnover in this example are five, uh, five species. No, six. Six. Why did I say five? One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five. Oh, yeah, there's five. I guess you can't count. So there you go. So, so the turnover there would be five species, right? Yeah. Beta, here, put up your notes. Beta is when we go across a gradient. So we're going from like the valley floor grassland to the grassland on the slopes, which is maybe you know different different rain or something like that nature, and then to the one on the top of the slope. So so beta is going across things, different different settings. Whereas gamma Gamma is the same community, grassland, but it's just in a, a different geographic location. So coastal foothills here, coastal foothills in the San Francisco Bay Area. Versus, versus say, starting, at the, foot, starting at, the, at the toe of the Santa Monica Mountains and then going up the Santa Monica Mountains. Go, the going up would be the beta. The going from this, this same flat uh, grassland at the bottom of the, the toe of the hill to one up in San Francisco, that would be gamma. Does that make sense? Um, the, the, yeah, there's, there's lots of, there's, we can get lots of issues. We, d we don't use these things as much, but, but I'll just say that, um, you know, there's, there's people that think about the theoretical distribution of species and, and the theoretical diversity of systems think a lot about this kind of stuff. And so they, they do things that say like, oh, the, the, the forest over here might be, have a higher alpha than the grassland. Um, and, and, uh, you know, the, but, but in, a, in a practical sense, this isn't, I would say, particularly helpful for most on the ground conservation stuff. It's informative in terms of thinking about big pictures, but on a day to day basis, we don't use these, these um, um, alpha, beta, gamma that much. We typically just use alpha. Um, what do you guys think? Do you guys think uh, alpha diversity is higher? Uh, here, uh, higher in a temperate rainforest or higher in a tropical rainforest? Tropical. Yeah, it's going to depend on what we're talking about, right? So if we're talking about um, insects, you might have one answer. If we're going to talk about um, fungus, you might have another answer. If we're going to talk about tree species, you might have another answer. 
Turns out that alpha diversity in tropical rainforests and temperate rainforests are, are um, for some things like the trees, are fairly comparable. But in other things like the insects, they, they tend to be more diverse in the tropics. So again, it's not, it's not one of these, you know, I, I showed you the picture of the grass, of, of the composition of the grassland, and it was fairly easy for you to spot the, the, the differences and whatever. It, it's, it's harder when we talk about um, these, um, these systems like in, in, the, in the theoretical. Okay, so, so to review, so we talked about diversity, we have richness, evenness, and heterogeneity, and then we have various assumptions with these things, right? We have an assumption um, that uh, uh, all individuals are, uh, count the same and, and all those things. And then we just touched on very briefly for, com for completeness, but we won't really return to this um, this semester, but uh, the idea of community specific diversity of the alpha, beta, and gamma diversity. Cool. Questions? All right, rock and roll. Um, so just to summarize, here we go. So pulling this stuff all together, um, we c species richness can be useful to compare things, right? So we can compare community A to community B with, with an, a, for example, a species accumulation curve, right? For example. Um, <coughs> we can compare um, the relative evenness of community one to community B, and that can help us understand uh, how, how diverse our systems are. We can compare A to B. And we can look at heterogeneity, which pulls all the, both those things together. Okay, cool. So I think that's all I had for this part. Yeah.